Well, this is James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl. And I read this when I was very young. And it starts very much like the sort of book I'd read before, but not for very long. Until he was four years old, James Henry Trotter had a happy life. He lived peacefully with his mother and father in a beautiful house beside the sea. There were always plenty of other children for him to play with, and there was a sandy beach for him to run about on and the ocean to paddle in. It was the perfect life for a small boy. Then, one day, James's mother and father went to London to do some shopping, and there a terrible thing happened. Both of them suddenly got eaten up, in full daylight, mind you, and on a crowded street, by an enormous angry rhinoceros, which had escaped from the London Zoo. When I first read that, it was like a little bomb going off in my head. I suddenly realised this book wasn't going to follow the rules. Strange and terrible things might happen at any moment. It was great. Now, I, I always enjoyed reading fantasy, even when I was very young. It's storytelling without limits, without breaks. Anything can happen. And it's not just escapism. Sometimes it's a good way of taking a step aside from reality and getting to view the real world from a totally different angle. Now, I like to try and mix the fantastical and the realistic and think through logical consequences from my very strange ideas because that makes the setting feel more concrete. And that way I can get readers to actually believe in these strange settings, which means that they then believe in the situations and the dangers that the characters face and actually care about the outcome. Well, it's true. Folk tales are a big influence on a number of my books, particularly Cuckoo Song. And I have always been fascinated by folk tales, fairy tales, legends, but not generally speaking, the pretty versions, not the Disney versions or the picture book versions, the older ones, which tend to be a little darker, crueler, uglier, more unfair. And these, these folk tales, they're not the sort of story that gets written down once and is fixed in one form forever. These stories are like living things. They're ever changing as they're told and retold and leap from person to person. And a story like that can only survive if it's saying something raw and real about people's hidden fears and hidden desires. I like folk tales because they're a bit feral. When I was growing up, I guess I always had this sense that People have hidden layers to them. They're, they're not always what they seem. And of course, this is part of what makes people fascinating and wonderful. But it's also potentially quite frightening. When you lift up the stone, you don't know if you're going to find treasure underneath or a snake. Now, when I was very young, I actually had an irrational fear of doubles, doppelgangers, people or things that look like people they're not. And I used to have nightmares where members of my family had been replaced by something that looked like them. I guess also I've had a strong sense of identity all my life and a, a gut feeling that being true to yourself is very important. So I find the idea of being replaced by an imposter that looks like you or being controlled by somebody else so that you're no longer really yourself anymore. I find these ideas very frightening. I'm fascinated by times of change, aftermath and revolution, when people have to adapt or sink. And I, I find these times incredibly interesting in their own right, but also they allow me to be really mean to my characters. I, I get to throw them into these turbulent situations where Everything they think they know has been turned upside down and there's chaos and they have to change the entire way they think about the world just to survive. Also, I really enjoy historical research. It's, it's a bit like treasure hunting. 
I get to dig through all these sources and find out all these crazy details about mad inventions or spy craft or corpse photography or weird superstitions or unhinged kinds of medicine. And then I get to take all the fun stuff and weave them into my story. Well, on the subject of historical fiction, I'd recommend Things a Bright Girl Can Do by Sally Nichols. It's actually about the fight for women's votes back in the, in the early 20th century in England. And it's seen through the eyes of three teenage girls. But even though it's talking about events over a hundred years ago, it's really lively and fast paced and vivid. And you really care about the characters. Well, here's an extract which describes my heroine Faith encountering the lie tree itself properly for the first time. On the far side of the cave, on a jutting oblong shelf of rock, stood a shrouded shape, the terracotta pot just visible beneath the cloth. There was something strange in the echoes of the vaulted cave. The roar of the nearby sea had been softened and twisted so that the air seemed full of sighs. Faith could not help glancing over her shoulder, thinking that somebody had just let out a long breath immediately behind her. The cold smell was bitter here, making her eyes sting. Slowly Faith slithered her way up the sloping stone floor. When she stood by the rocky shelf, she reached up and slowly pulled at the cloth. She felt resistance, the tug of thorns, and then the oilskin came away, revealing a black, indistinct tangle that spilt over the edges of the pot a scribble of shadow on shadow. I'm going to talk a little bit about my latest book, Deep Light, which is coming out in Italy in the summer. It's set in a place called the Myriad, a long sprawling chain of islands about a thousand miles long. For centuries, the islanders were terrorised by these vast hideous gods that used to rise up like sea monsters from the depths and bite ships into and destroy harbour towns. Until one day, quite unexpectedly, they turned on each other and tore each other to pieces. When the water settled, the islanders found that all the gods were dead. All that was left were these huge, hideous corpses rolling in the deep. But over the last 30 years, the locals have discovered that the little pieces of these gods are actually really useful. They can be used to build new forms of technology. So lots of people venture down into the deep in rickety little submarines and diving suits in order to try and find pieces of these dead gods and make their fortune. Now the main character of Deep Light is a 14 year old orphan called Hark bit of a con artist and a petty thief and while trying to rescue a friend of his he will find a piece of one of these gods but it's rather stranger and more dangerous than any of the other fragments and unlike the others it occasionally moves as though it's still alive. This is my study I have to admit, I don't usually show it to people because it's also a storeroom and so it's a bit scruffy. Now, this is my desk and uh, as you can see, lots of books. We have far too many books. In fact, we've got to the point where we've ended up making bookshelves out of books so that we can put more books on them. Now, over here, we have a collection of lanyards that I've been given when attending literary festivals, conventions and things like that. And I quite like just having them all in view like that. Now, 
I'm also a live action role player and historical reenactor as a hobby. So in here, I have quite a few bits and pieces of costume. And in fact, if you look down there, you can see some of my hats and masks.